Um, and, and welcome to all of you. I'm, I'm just delighted to have the opportunity to be here. I'm going to race through this relatively quickly because we've got a full agenda today. These are the big questions. Why is it important and what's the role of embassies and consulates? Uh, it's important because of what's happened to the world in terms of the human species and its impact on the planet. Uh, I've reduced this to megatons of carbon in vertebrates, uh, both for uh, people and for our domesticated animals and for wild vertebrates in the ocean and for wild land animals. As you take a quick look through that, you can sort of see that we are absolutely dominating the planet now. Uh, just by ourselves, we weight eight times as much as all wild species on Earth. And when you put our domesticated animals, which are there for our food and things, uh, it comes up to 28 times as much. What humans do, what we, how we choose to live and build communities and the footprint that we have on the planet is, is just stunning. It's the equivalent now of, of a geophysical force. We can change the climate. Um, nature has, for the last... Now, it appears about three and a half billion years, if you have a fairly loose definition of life, been beta testing different ways that life can get together, and it's developed uh, these ecosystems that have a number of forces that all come into equilibrium and allow sustainability in a very true sense, sustainability that lasts millions of years. Humans come together and build things that may have a lower life expectancy. Um, and we're doing more and more of it in the Ermit sense, um, it's driven by policy. Some nations have simply chosen that they're going to be moving people into the cities. It's driven by climate disruption. There are now increasing numbers of climate refugees. By economic opportunity uh, and by the ecological undermining of world agriculture, which has been driving people off of the farms and the cities is where they can go to. This is what the United Nations expects to be seeing happen over the course of the next uh, about 20 years. And as you can see, the trend is uniform around the planet. In a number of places, and I'm not going to be identifying these places because it's not a smackdown for anybody, but, but you get some relatively attractive looking things. This very same scene when viewed from the other direction but in the same city is this. Uh, urbanization is not uh, an, an unmixed blessing. And even when it's done in a way that is a bit more modern and has a few better sanitation facilities, it still can be incredibly bleak. And even when you have the most prosperous country in the world that is now 85% urbanized, it, it has its own problems attendant on it. There was a time when what we built was reflective of the climate regimes in which we were and, and buildings were supposed to and did, in fact, function in ways that minimized the amount of energy that they used. You'd have these thick walls and few windows down in deserts, and then you'd have these bright, airy spaces if you were in a relatively humid area. Today, urban areas that are building modern buildings basically are building the same building for basically all purposes in basically all different climates and pumping enormous amounts of energy into them to make them function. When prizes are given for architecture, they are for the most part not driven by functionality at all. They're, they're driven by sculpture. They're by things that are really quite beautiful. but but not very efficient to operate, not designed for the efficacy of their particular tasks, and certainly not designed for the climate that they are in. And the costs of feeding power into these things is kind of staggering. This is what my region of the United States may soon be blessed with, although we are fighting against it. Uh, in theory, we would have something upwards of 12 to 15 of these mile-long coal trains passing through our cities uh, every day. And the consequences of burning that coal are kind of con horrible. And the indirect consequences when you get into climate issues are pretty horrible. This is not meant to be the end of humanity. <laughs> uh, a few more. You know, in, in New York, if you don't have a subway available to you, which you obviously didn't, it's not important because in New York, everyone takes taxis. It was uh, an upsetting period. Cities ought to be healthy ecosystems that are designed uh, on the basis of about 35, uh, uh, about 3.5 billion years of Darwinian beta testing using the fruits of modern science and technology to promote the well-being of the dominant species in the urban ecosystem, people. Cities ought to consist of living buildings that are inside vibrant, resilient neighborhoods. And that's basically what I'm talking about today as it might apply to those buildings as embassies and consulates. 
This is my building. Uh, it was designed for a particular area, let's just say Seattle. So we generate as much energy from sunshine that falls on the roof of a building, it's a six-story building, as that building uses annually in a city that is not widely known for its sunshine. Uh, that requires us to have a roof that is pretty big, just as nature would have a canopy that is pretty big in an area like this. This is a tree that's outside our building. Uh, it is a, an elegant building with a lot of daylighting, and it uses very little energy. The average office building in Seattle uses 92,000 BTUs per square foot per year. If you get a lead building and take it all the way to lead platinum and get all of your energy credits and operate it pretty well, it gets it down as far as 32, uh, we'll be at 16. Uh, so from 92 to 16 is a fairly precipitous drop. We calculated what that would be by finding out what was the biggest area that we could cover with solar modules, how much sunshine do we have per year. You do the multiplication with the efficiency of the modules to find out how much electricity you can generate, and that then became the energy budget for the building. We built it to function, designed it for that function and did it this way, which just sort of graphically illustrates the savings. And this is just another shot of the building and showing that it's nestled right smack in the middle of an urban area. Uh, and an urban area that if you look at the upper left-hand corner of that chart, you'll see is not the first place that you would go if you wanted to power your building on sunbeams in the United States. In fact, pretty much the last place to go. And this is just a few shots of what it is like on the inside. Because we have our shutters on the outside of the building, the sunlight, when we don't want it to come in the building, doesn't. We've actually got, it, it's a living building in the sense it has a nervous system that is spread out. So there's devices outside that tell you whether the wind is blowing or not, how fast it's blowing, what direction it's blowing from, how warm or cool is it, is it raining, how intense is the sunlight. And we've got similar things measuring the conditions inside the building, all of which feed into a computer that among other things knows the parameters that it has to keep the building within in terms of stuffiness and temperature, but also has programmed into it where the sun is on the horizon at every moment of every day because that's predictable. What you don't know is how much clouds there are, but the nervous system feeds in how intense the sunlight is. That tells you whether the shades should be up or down, whether the window should be open or closed. It functions like an organism responding. Uh, we had a very hot summer this year in Seattle. Uh, the major office buildings downtown were just pouring energy into it, running air conditioners that left them uncomfortable. This building never got above 73 degrees, and it doesn't have air conditioning. It just opens up the windows in the middle of the night, cools down the concrete slabs, uses the shades coming down to keep sunlight out when it wants it out, and functioned just magnificently. It also captures the rainwater that falls on the roof, stores it behind that plywood wall in a 56,000 gallon cistern, and then puts it through the series of increasingly fine filters. The one on the far right, that blue device up there, takes out things as small as viruses. The two little silver things down on the bottom are ultraviolet, just in case anything got past the filters, and produces potable drinking water from the rain that falls on the roof. The gray water from the building is re-cleansed afterwards and injected into the ground. So the building functions like a Douglas fir forest, right? It's it powered by the sunlight that falls on it, and the rain that falls on it doesn't come down off the roof into a gutter, down an asphalt street, into a storm sewer to flush complex hydrocarbons into Puget Sound. It goes directly into the ground underneath the building after it's been used to promote life. Only building in the world with six-story composting toilets. Uh, time will tell whether that was a wise investment or not so far. <laughs> Uh, it also has eliminated 362 chemicals that are toxic, carcinogenic, mutagenic, endocrine disrupting, anything that would be unhealthy for the people in the building. And it has, it, it actually has dozens of design criteria that are trying to lead people to have healthier lives. One of them is to have an irresistible stairway. You walk into the front door of any commercial office building and you're confronted by a bank of elevators. If you search around, you may find a stairway that you can get into. If you can, it's dark, it's dismal, it's uninviting, it often has a bit of odor to it. You climb up five stories and you run into a locked door. Uh, in our building, if you walk in through the front door, you find this glass-enclosed stairway that has some of the most magnificent views of, of the Space Needle and the Olympic Mountains in, in Seattle. 
another element that we had was a design life of 250 years. That's, that's one that just runs smack into the teeth of modern economics. What is the discounted present value of a dollar you receive 250 years from now? I mean, it, is, it doesn't exist. It's infinitesimal. And so banks will not loan you money based upon a valuation of the building that looks out more than 45 or 50 years. So to put the additional things in it that, among other things, will let us survive an earthquake, uh, we had to pay for that 100% ourselves. That's something that the financial system has to adjust itself to deal with. This is New College in Oxford. That's the most recent of the set of buildings in Oxford. Those buildings are 600 years old. We used to design for durability. Uh, we don't, it's not that they had better materials. They didn't have better engineers. They didn't have better architects. They just didn't have economists. Um, it <laughs> okay, again, about this building, which I should say is 52,000 square feet, pretty small for an embassy, not bad for an awful lot of consulates around the world that I think could possibly pick up some lessons from us. It's the first six-story building in the United States to be truly energy neutral from sunbeams hitting its own roof, again in Seattle. It's the most energy efficient office building in the United States. It's the first public office building in the United States to use rainwater for potable drinking water, showers, and so forth. The first office building in an American city to infiltrate all of its treated gray water into the soil on site. The first commercial structure in the United States to receive project certification from the Forest Stewardship Council, which is to say all of the wood in this building came from a forest that was managed in a way so that 10,000 years from now it would still be producing wood and it would be maintaining healthy ecosystems during that period cost a little bit of a premium, less than 10%. We get nothing out of it that benefits us directly except a forest out there that's functioning the way that forests ought to. Um, first six-story building in the world to use composting toilets and the first large commercial structure in the world to attempt to meet the living building challenge, which is the toughest set of criteria for buildings. This is why it's important for public buildings, such as embassies and consulates, to do this. If you're looking at the market, today and where it makes economic sense with today's technology, today's economic criteria, and today's financial system, you find that there's an investment barrier here somewhere between gold and platinum on a lead category. And at that point, there are still a great many public burdens that, in a properly functioning economy, ought to be moving that line to the right. But when you look at what the costs are of these things and what the market value is of buildings, people will pay a little bit more for a green building, but those lines tend to cross right about there. And uh, that leaves us with all of this, where the public sector, which is building institutionally something, I mean, nobody builds an embassy in order to get it fully rented and then flipped to a REIT or an insurance company in three years. You buy them to hold them in perpetuity institutionally, and that gives you a real investment in it over the long term. Plus. The buildings that you build say something about you as nations. Uh, it gives you an opportunity to, if you will, show off a little bit what your cultural traditions offer in, in the environmental sphere and what uh, technologies you may have to offer. This is just a running through some of those things that you can get from having a super green building, which, again, is what this is all about. Um, then finally, just a pitch at the end for Earth Day. Uh, we're coming up now in 2020 on the 50th anniversary of the first Earth Day and the 30th anniversary of the first International Earth Day. There'll be a series of themes each year going on toward 2020, building an increasing sort of momentum behind the event and the campaign surrounding it. And for the first two of those, it'll be focused upon green cities and the built green environment. This is a typical Earth Day event here in Washington, D.C. They tend to be huge when we do them successfully and have the opportunity to really convey an educational message, not just to the people in the crowds, but to the people that are exposed to all of this through the media, and hopefully to change political sensitivities in ways that make new policy opportunities available. Um, so when we're talking about Earth Day in 2014 and 2015, our real hope is that at least by 2015, a great many embassies and consulates around the world will be using their buildings, in some cases even constructing new buildings, that will allow them to showcase the products, the designs, the visions that their nations can offer. And We are placing domestically a, 
as much pressure as we can upon the Department of State to be doing this. And I should say the Department of State has been very responsive, uh, even aggressively leading in it. And uh, we would love to see this sort of thing come up around the world. It's just a, a wonderful opportunity to convey what you can offer. And these are the connections of people from the Earth Day Network that you can get in contact with. If any of you would like to play a leadership role of getting these things introduced in your countries, we would be delighted to work with you. Thank you.